Hello, my name is Diane Logan. I'm president of the Friends of Cedar Mountain, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today on this 150th anniversary of the Battle of Cedar Mountain. Where you're sitting today, more armies, more times, came through Culpeper, camped in Culpeper, and fought in Culpeper than any place else in this country. And Virginia, Pope's army, is just created in June of 1862. Big month. In the, in the formation of, of these two armies, one that would last the war, one that would last a campaign. Pope had never been to Culpeper in his life. In his life, he'd never been there. But he knew he could read a map as well as anybody else, and he looked at that map of Virginia, and he sees that that railhead at Gordonsville, that's the place I gotta go. And then I can attack Richmond, come in behind and offer you. This is what he's thinking. What this guy's thinking. Well, he might have had an offensive mind, John Pope. He might have had. But he had he was nowhere in the same universe with the truly audacious offensive mind of Robert Lee. And Robert Lee, Robert Lee was not about to be caught black by the likes of John Pope. Now, this is interesting because both armies at this point had staked a claim on going on the offense. Both of them, Pope and the Confederates. Now, Jackson's Confederate Army of the Valley, with Jackson's division under General Winder and Ewell's division, started to lead the Richmond defenses. But as they leave the Richmond defenses, they're looking over their shoulder. Will McClellan stay in place? Pope fails to unite his, his army early on, uh, and really fails to, to unite them at all. Until it's too late. It continues to amaze me that that individuals like like Banks, even though they bring a lot to the table politically for for Lincoln, that Banks would continue to be uh, promoted, uh, serving later in the war during the Port Hudson campaign, where I think he wins there just because Grant takes Vicksburg. Uh, McDowell here, uh, probably the only commander that that got along with Pope. McDowell and Pope uh, served for years after the war and are promoted and given very prominent uh, department level positions, um, even though they failed miserably as battlefield commanders during the Civil War. Pope and Siegel uh, really failed to support uh, Banks, who's fighting Jackson all by his lonesome here. Um, Siegel is just down the road in Sperryville uh, and is, uh, is told to help support Banks, but Siegel doesn't know what road to take, even though there's only one road in the area. <laughs> Soldiers did not insult women in either army, and General Lee found his orders and found his actions a Pope absolutely savage farms and burned down farms and stole supplies. He did because these orders were seen by the common soldier as a license to steal, plunder, pillage. And that happened in Culpeper County. Pope brought total war to Culpeper County. He savaged this county. General Lee did not like this. And he especially did not like women being left at home, their husbands in the army, being insulted and taken advantage of, robbed of food stuffs by soldiers. So he writes Jackson, I want Poe to be suppressed. <laughs> I want Poe to be suppressed. As Todd says, he refers to Poe as the miscreant Poe. But you can look all through General Lee's life and career, and you'll never find him saying a bad word about anybody except 
John Cole, who he calls him Mr. Uh, the Confederate Army had a right. You know, they had these competent, their competent generals where it was needed uh, here, in, here in the East to some extent. Um, and then there were certainly competent generals in the West. Although when, when Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee had these more inept generals, they didn't keep them around. All right, maybe Lincoln should have adopted that strategy early on instead of promoting these, uh, these political generals. I'm gonna end. In April of 62, Jackson would write to his wife, and that's one of my favorite quotes of all of Jackson. He wrote to his wife that he would like to create an army of the living God. And I believe Jackson meant every word of that. But within that army of living God, relatively speaking, some of the worst sinners happened to be in the five regiments that would be the Stonewall Brigade. He had problems with these boys. This is a way of, of Lee taking care of a, a problem in his forces in Richmond. He sends Jackson with his command. Stonewall needs reinforcements, and he sends him out there. Now, here's what he says. General Lee to Jackson in a letter. As A.P. Hill arrives in Gordonsville, July the 29th. A.P. Hill, you will, I think, find a good officer with whom you can consult. And by advising your division commanders as to their movements, much trouble can be saved you in arranging details as they, the division commanders, act more intelligently. Do you think Jackson read this? Do you think he read this thing? <laughs> Fire! Fire! Battle broke out. It was an artillery movement that lasted for nearly two hours, starting around 4 o'clock, ending approximately 5 35. The march? His frustrations with uh, A.P. Hill's placement in this in this march, uh, due to the um, perhaps perhaps a miscarriage of orders, or the fact that uh, Jackson did not relay the message to uh, the Hill as to um, the change in uh, Ewell's uh, route of the march. Uh, but this had caused some uh, some conflict already, and so the, the march had already been a frustrating one for for Jackson. Um, Jackson also faced frustrations with his cavalry under Beverly Robertson. He's not convinced that Robertson was uh, vigorous in scouting out the federal positions uh, and providing an adequate screen. So the uh, infantry would be shedding regiments along the way uh, to, uh, to guard the train and also to guard the flanks. And early pulled his troops back under cover of the uh, little rise of ground there. So they could uh, receive cover from this incoming artillery fire. Early believed his position there on the Crimson Farm could be strong, a strong one to, uh, to maintain if he were adequately reinforced. And so he sent back for assistance first to Winder for infantry to extend his left across the road, and then for artillery to suppress the Union batteries that are about to blow.
I will tell you this, Jackson left a sting behind him. And indeed he did. August the 9th, 150 years ago today, Stonewall Jackson left a sting behind him at Cedar Mountain. Joshua R. Stover, Major, 10th Virginia Infantry.